Welcome back, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here, bringing you China History Podcast, Episode 235. Part 5 in our overview of the Chinese warlord era that lasted 1916 to 1928. It still lingered on after that, but let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Last time in Part 4, I left you hanging right at the lead-up to the first anhui Zhili War. They should have called it the anhui Zhili Battle. It only lasted nine days. And from here on out, there will be a number of these military clashes amongst the various cliques. And as we keep walking along the timeline, I'll introduce them to you one at a time. This anhui Zhili War was the first. Last time in Part 4, we saw how in late 1917... Duan Qi Rei and his forces had gone down into Hunan to put an end to this breakaway province's ambitions and independence from the northern Beiyang clique dominated government. But after a poor showing and failing in the main mission, Duan had to go back to Beijing with his tail between his legs. He shortly thereafter resigned from the premiership and withdrew from the scene to lick his wounds and ponder the seething ill feelings he had for Feng Guozhang, Cao Kun, and Wu Pei Fu, the big three of the Zhirli clique. And not just that, at the time of this Anhui Zhirli war, Duan was really catching a ton of grief about the terms of those Nishihara loans. That whole transaction, as beneficial as it was to the Anhui clique organization, had done nothing to help his brand. The Mukden incident, where Japan really lets it all hang out, was still 13 years away, but by accepting that 150 or 200 million yen loan, Duan Chi Rei really rolled out the red carpet for the Japanese in northern China. And not just that. You know how back in the Han Dynasty we always associate the word usurper with the statesman and later emperor Wang Mang? Well, for Duan Qi Rei, the word traitor ended up getting indelibly attached to his name. He caught a lot of grief, as did a lot of others who got too friendly with the Japanese around this time. By April 1918, Cao Kun had sent forces down to Hunan and accomplished what Duan could not. The Constitutional Protection Army, the Hu Fa Jun, was pushed out, and then after Settling scores in Hunan, the Zhirli clique, resisting Duan's continued insistence on a military solution to defeat the southern renegade provinces, well, rather than take the fight this far south, Wu Peifu became the man of the hour by negotiating a peaceful settlement with the three biggest warlords down there, and we'll get to them later on. These were Tang Chi Yao in Yunnan, Lu Rongting in Guangxi, and Chen Jiongming in Guangdong. And after everyone was able to come to an agreement, that ratcheted things down a few notches between the rival northern and southern governments. And that also spelled the end of the Constitutional Protection War. In May of 1918, the southern government, led by Sun Yat-sen, was reorganized and All the decision-making spots were filled with military men. Now, I have nothing against the military, but filling all the top government ministries, governorships, and executive branch positions with these fellas in charge, it was no way to launch a republic. If some of you are getting a bit overwhelmed with all these Chinese names, these warlords and politicians, again, go to the website at teacup.media. I have it all sorted out for you. If you include all the small fries and medium-sized ones, there's more than a hundred of these warlords and generals all over China. But there's only perhaps a dozen that are always mentioned in the history books and scholarly papers when talking about this terrible time, this Chinese warlord era. And as World War I comes to an end, China is all carved up mainly between the southern government led by Sun Yat-sen and his military backers and the much larger but fractured northern government. And where there used to be one single voice, Yuan Shikai's, who spoke for the north, well, now we have multiple contenders. 
Duan Chi Rei and his Anhui clique and their military assets were now in a wrestling match with the Jirli clique that up until his death at the end of 1919 was led by Feng Guozhang. And as Feng's health had begun to fade, the mantle of leadership of the Jirli clique was passed to Cao Kun, and Cao's two deputies were Wu Pei Fu and Sun Chuan Fang. Cao and Wu we looked at briefly last episode. I'll get to Sun Chuan Fang in parts six or seven. These are all top names from this warlord era. Cao Kun had a passion for being a player in the political arena. His right-hand man, Wu Pei Fu, was more the military expert, so they were a team. Now, before we dive into the Anhui Zhili War, let me first introduce another major warlord of this time. This was Zhang Zolin. Of all the warlords I'll introduce, he managed to hang on to power the longest. He was at the head of the Feng Tian clique out in the northeast, Manchuria. And one more for you to remember. Now, for the 22 years lasting from 1907 to 1929, when all this was taking place, Liaoning province was known as Feng Tian province. Zhang Zolin ran Manchuria, today's provinces of Heilongjiang, Jilin, and Liaoning. He had his own set of nicknames, but the Manchurian warlord was what he gets called most often, I would venture to say, with the Tiger of Manchuria in second place. The Old Marshal, he's also known as, to differentiate him from his son, Zhang Xueliang, known as the Young Marshal, way, way in the future. Zhang Zolin was born in Haicheng, a city about midway between Shenyang and Dalian, Liaoning province. He was the third son of a poor family and only had about two years of any kind of formal schooling. Unlike his future adversary, Wu Pei Fu, he was not an educated man. According to one of the legends from his youth, he tried to avenge his father's death and in carrying out the act, he used a little too much force, had to flee his hometown. And with limited options, Zhang Zolin joined the army and saw action in the Sino-Japanese War. And after that, he ended up taking a position as a kind of security guard for his father-in-law's village. Now, in these times, roving bandit gangs were endemic all over northern China. They would march into any number of quiet little villages and just plunder the hell out of them, turn them upside down, conscript a male or two, and move on to their next meal. Villages and towns that could afford it would recruit a small militia to protect them from this early 20th century scourge. They had a name for these security guards, or roving militias, and they called them Red Beards, Hong Huzi. Zhang Zolin had the good fortune to end up in the right place at the right time on a number of occasions. He and a couple others, who would become part of his inner circle, rose up to positions of power, fighting against these bandits at the provincial level. And he also stood by the Qing government's side during the Boxer Rebellion. And during the Russo-Japanese War, he fought on Japan's side and used his army to harass the Russians. And as far as Zhang Zolin's association with the Japanese, that support he gave Japan during that war ended up being the beginning of a beautiful relationship for a while. By 1907, after folding his troops into the provincial army, Zhang Zolin was commanding his own battalion, and at the time of the Wuchang Uprising, 1911, at the behest of the governor general, he put down the revolutionary forces there and helped keep Shenyang and all of Liaoning loyal to the emperor, at least until a better offer came. Now, upon the establishment of the Republic of China, Zhang Zolin ended up getting in real tight with Yuan Shikai, and by now he had the command of his own division. And these forces became the core of his military power. I said that last episode. The command given to these Beiyang generals by Yuan Shikai, their rank and the troops that came with that rank, served as their elite personal army later on. 
And in return for backing Yuan in his run for the emperorship, Zhang was made governor general of Feng Tian. And really, as I said before, with Wang Chan Yuan in Hubei, that's all you needed. That was the golden ticket you had to hold in order to become a warlord. In this way, not only did Zhang Zolin command the military, but he had his hands on all the controls of the civilian government as well. And after Yuan died and that free-for-all happened, when every governor-general began to transform into a warlord in their respective provinces, Zhang Zolin was no exception. He kicked out the governor's general of the other two provinces and filled those spots with his own nominees. And by doing so, he took over all three provinces that made up Manchuria. And these two other military governors, these Du Jins put in place by Zhang, they were able to run their respective provinces like any other warlord, but always deferred to Zhang Zolin in all matters that he got involved in. Remember, when all this happened, Duan Qirui had taken over from Yuan Shikai, and in order to consolidate his power, well, he needed to make a lot of friends. So he won Zhang Zolin over to his side by appointing him Inspector General of the Eastern Three Provinces. And once he got comfortable there in those Eastern Three Provinces of Manchuria, Zhang Zolin continued to put together his own power base that included local military officers and other elites of the realm. And as I said, this became known as the Feng Tian clique. The Anhui and Zhili cliques will try to win him over to their side. But Zhang always looked out for number one first, and always. And he ran these three provinces of northeast China with his iron a fist as any warlord. He had to constantly fight off attempts by the central government to dilute his control of Manchuria by sending all these appointees in his direction. But Zhang was very adept at keeping the central government at bay and controlling all of Manchuria by himself. And even though it was technically part of the Republic of China, he negotiated directly with foreign powers, signed treaties, cut deals, everyone who had an ounce of political astuteness knew. Zhang Zolin was the ultimate authority in that northeast corner of China. Anyway, later on, after he had consolidated all his power in Manchuria, his attention turned southward in the direction of northern China. And this ambition he had to take Beijing for himself would end up conflicting with the interests of Cao Kun and Wu Peifu. But for now... The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And in this war that was brewing, Zhang Zolin took the side of the Zhili clique against Duan Qirui and his Anhui clique armies. Zhili, Anhui, and now Feng Tian, these three warlord groups, all contending in the north. And remember, whoever controlled Beijing, well, that was the official government of China that world leaders and diplomats dealt with not to mention the bankers as well. And because the northern government was so fractured and unable to agree on anything, and we remember China in 1919 got taken to the cleaners at the Treaty of Versailles. So this Manchurian warlord, he was quite good at building bonds between himself and his key military allies. And it didn't stop there. The Zhili Feng Tian Alliance also sought to build strategic bridges with southern warlords in Guangxi and Yunnan. And as the drumbeat got louder, other warlords in central and eastern China will line up with Cao Kun and Wu Peifu against Duan Qirui in this Anhui Zhili War. This had all been brewing for a while. What really started up the gears of war, involved a political crisis that followed Duan Qirui's incursions into Outer Mongolia. He had sent one of his top generals there to take back Outer Mongolia for the Republic of China. As I said, Zhang Zolin didn't like that. Having Anhui clique forces this close to Manchuria was too close for comfort. And for sure, the Zhili faction wasn't happy. So after one of Duan's Right-hand men, Xu Shuzheng, took his armies into Mongolia. The Feng Tian and Zhili cliques 
ended up becoming strange bedfellows for this war against Duan's Anhui forces. Xu Shucheng was the de facto leader of the Anfu Club, and a very close comrade of Duan Qi Rei. Remember them from last episode, the Anfu Club? Yeah, because it was located on Anfu Lane in Beijing. This was the political arm of Duan Qi Rei's whole Anhui organization. And they dominated the Beijing government. Xu got yanked out of Mongolia by the compromised president who I mentioned last time, someone having the confusingly similar name of Xu Shichang, two Xus, but they ain't on the same side. Being challenged so blatantly like this, Duan had no choice but to pull Xu Xu Zheng's army out of Mongolia and get them heading in a southerly direction towards Beijing to take on their Zhirli enemies. Duan and Xu Xu Zheng of the Anhui clique versus the combined forces of the Zhirli and Fengtian cliques. And the prize was control of the Beiyang organization that operated all the buttons and levers of the northern government based in Beijing. Bad blood had arose between these two opposing factions ever since the Hufa Yundong, the constitutional protection movement, with everyone now in control of their own armies and with so much at stake in this post World War I period in China, the battles began. Now, towards the end of 1919, Wu Peifu had already cemented alliances between his Zhirli clique and Tang Jiyao of the Yunnan clique and Lu Rongting of the Guangxi clique. And they, as well as other warlords in central and northern China, all ganged up on Duan Qi Rei and his Anhui clique. And to light this powder keg, the shot across the bow that sparked this Anhui Zhirli war, this first open warfare between the once unified Beiyang warlords, was the open denouncement of Duan Qi Rei signed by all of Wu Peifu's warlord allies. No words were minced, and Duan was called out for his traitorous deeds, primarily with respect to the Nishihara loans. So between being dissed by having his guy pulled out of Outer Mongolia and all the drubbing he was getting in the media from stories planted by Jirli clique leaders, he had to respond. And like I said at the outset, this war didn't last terribly long. It took place about 50 miles south of Beijing. The Anhui armies, led by Duan, Xu Shuzheng, and Xu Tongfeng, went on the offensive and had a few good days until Wu Peifu's armies turned everything around. July 17th, uh, we're in the year 1920, Wu Peifu's troops overwhelmed the Anhui armies and captured the general, Chu Tongfeng. And Zhang Zolin was holding down the fort 250 miles to the east, right where the Great Wall meets the Bohai Sea. As soon as things took a turn for the worse for the Anhui forces, Zhang Zolin's Feng Tian army attacked from the east, and everything fell apart for Duan Qi Rei. With so much firepower from all directions, Lined up against him, the odds weren't good to begin with. But with Zhang Zolin moving in hard and fast from the east, it ended quickly. And with Duan Qi Rei on the run, the victorious Zhirli and Feng Tian cliques took over the reins of power in the Beijing government. And whatever unity that once existed in the Beiyang organization, eh, those days were now over. So July 1920... There's a new team in control of the northern government. Duan Qi Rei had run it since Yuan Shikai died in June 1916. Xu Shichang remained the president of the republic, serving till June 1922. Duan Qi Rei, with this defeat, was no longer an important player, and from now on, he stays in the back seat until he's dragged back into the government from 1924 to 1926 as a compromised chief executive of the Republic. We'll get to that in part six or seven. Until then, Duan kept a low profile living inside the Japanese settlement in Tianjin and later in Shanghai. In his retirement, he had become an extremely devout Buddhist and found solace in the religion until his death in November 1936. In 1920, 
the Anhui clique? Well, it didn't disappear, but it sort of it dissolved. And most of the officers and politicians either went in the direction of Feng Tian or Zhi Li. This was quite a victory for Zhang Zolin. Wu Peifu's armies had done all the heavy lifting and defeating the Anhui army. Zhang Zolin's troops did more mopping up than anything. But like I said, he was good at capitalizing on whatever opportunities came his way. So these two victorious factions, Zhang Zolin's Feng Tian clique and Wu Peifu and Cao Kun's Zhi Li clique, they formed a coalition government and quotation marks around that word coalition. And in less than two years, the Manchurian warlord and the Jade Marshal, Wu Peifu, they'll be at each other's throats. And right as this Jirli Anhui War ends, there's a terrible famine in North China. Most affected were the people of Jirli, Shandong, Shanxi, Shanxi, and Henan. And this was known as the Great North China Famine of the winter of 1920-21. Thanks to incredible humanitarian efforts, only half a million peasants perished and this natural disaster, but there were other famines and natural disasters around China that happened during these years at the dawn of the 1920s. Warlordism wasn't the direct cause of these famines, but it was an additional layer of misery added on top of the breakdown in law and order and how that affected the peasantry and their daily lives. Anyway, up in Beijing, as I indicated, cordial relations between Wu Peifu and Zhang Zolin in no time at all were starting to break down. Zhang Zolin, he had a lot of ambition and was very much intent on squeezing out Wu Peifu, seizing sole control of the government, and then unify China by defeating the southern warlords. A similar dream like Xiang Yu and Liu Bang once had going back over 21 centuries before. And Wu Peifu, well, he had the same idea, so you know where this is heading. Whoever controlled the historic and symbolic city of Beijing was, in the eyes of those inside and outside China, the legitimate government of the country. And Beijing was only big enough for one warlord, and one of them had to go. And it ran deeper than this, wheels within wheels. The Western nations, with a finger in China's pie, well, they mostly lined up behind Wu Peifu. And as I mentioned, even though he was no less a patriot than any other leader, Zhang Zolin had Japan watching his back. With this competition between the two warlord cliques, it was only a matter of time before something would ignite the powder keg. Zhang Zolin went and did a sneaky thing. He installed one of his men, Liang Shiyi, as premier. A very bold power move that would have given Zhang control of the government through the office of premier. Now, we've mentioned Liang Shiyi before in previous episodes. He was one of Yuan Shikai's political cronies going way back. And as soon as Wu Peifu found out what Zhang Zolin had gone and done, well, his outrage was predictable. And after Liang Shiyi started holding up government funds that should have gone in the direction of the Zhirli clique, well, that was it. Decisions were being made in Beijing independent of Wu Peifu, which made a mockery of the whole idea of a coalition government. Liang Shiyi was forced by Wu Peifu to resign after a month. And then these two sides geared up for battle. And like the Zhirli Anhui War, this one known as the First Zhirli Feng Tian War. It was quick, too. April, May, and June, 1922. Where was it fought? Eh, same as before. South of Beijing and Tianjin. Over the course of the fighting, Zhang Zolin's forces appeared to have this one in the bag. He attacked on two fronts, from the east and west. At first, he pushed Wu Peifu's armies back on their heels. But for the second time as he had done against the Anhui forces, Wu Peifu outsmarted, outflanked, and outperformed his opponent's main army and pushed them all the way to the China coast, to Shanghai Guan. Wu Peifu, he had a little help from former 
Zhili troops who had defected to Zhang Zolin's side after the death of Feng Guozhang in 1919 and then rejoined Zhili forces after the outbreak of this war. And let me tell you, they won't be the first army to switch sides in the middle of a war and change the tide of battle. Finally, the British had to be called in to broker a peace. And as part of the deal, Zhang Zolin had to remove his army from south of Shanghai Guan over near Qinhuangdao in Hebei province, still called Zhili province as all this is happening. And Zhang's armies suffered 70,000 killed, wounded, or captured. And in these times, desertion was also rampant. He had to start rebuilding at once. So either way you look at it, the first Zhili Feng Tian War was a bitter defeat for Zhang Zolin. And once Zhang Zolin was safely back in Manchuria after suffering this defeat on the military and political battlefield, Wu Pei Fu and the Zhili clique scraped away all remnant Feng Tian clique men out of any position of power in Beijing. And now they ran it for themselves. And with the Feng Tian clique no longer in positions of power in Beijing, eh, the Japanese weren't happy about the outcome either. And with Wu Peifu, a well-known Japan hater in charge, eh, things weren't going to be easy for them in North China. And here is where Wu Peifu, over the next two years, rose to become the most powerful and prominent leader in northern and central China. Zhang Zuolin continued to tightly control Manchuria. No one could challenge him on his home turf. He had declared autonomy in Manchuria and stood a band apart from the Beijing government, now dominated by Wu Peifu and the Zhili politicians and militarists. In all the provinces of the north, all the way down to Hunan, Wu Peifu, to varying degrees, controlled what went on there. And as I said, in September 1924, Time magazine had him on their cover. And not more than two weeks after Wu Peifu made the cover of Time, he and Zhang Zolin were at it again in the second Zhili Feng Tian War. Now, I'm not going to get into that here. We'll save that for next time. Boy, listening to these episodes, you'd think these wars were all that was going on in China. <laughs> well, that was hardly the case. With no one single emperor or king or party chairman in charge of the whole country, there were sideshows going on all over the place. In Xinjiang, in Tibet, in Guangzhou and Hong Kong, Guangxi and all those southern provinces, Shanghai in the 1920s, what we've looked at from all kinds of angles, that whole world that evokes a thousand images and culture, entertainment, and commerce. That, too, was all happening during these warlord years. Well, the list of warlords is getting longer and longer, and these were just the major ones. In the first Zhili Feng Tian War, it was more than Zhang Zolin and Wu Pei Fu commanding troops. I'm going out of my way to spear you from too many names raining down on you, but everything's all organized for you in a List of terms found at the teacup.media website. We'll pick up in part six with the continuation of this story and the lead up to the second Zhili Feng Tian War. I'll give you a hint. This one turns out a little better for the Manchurian warlord. And how can we talk about the second Zhili Feng Tian War without introducing Feng Yuxiang, the Christian warlord? He's a favorite of many, another colorful character from this miserable time. Even in our day, on all our news feeds and on TV, we can see cities and countries around the world that are wrecked with civil war, political division, and human suffering. Well, this kind of thing is as old as history itself. And in the 1920s, it was China's turn to be the one hit with this instability, and like it is everywhere, the peasants and common people trying to survive the times inevitably suffered the greatest. I don't want you to lose hope. These warlords, they do finally get neutralized, and we'll get to that happy ending, I assure you. 
Once again, thanks to everyone who have signed up to support me in the CHP at Patreon.com. I hope you're enjoying that recent story about me and the World Cup trophy. Patreon.com, if you'd like to give a small monthly donation, or if you're plain old just don't like this model, you can always donate to the official CHP PayPal account at China History Podcast at gmail.com. My greatest and most heartfelt thanks either way. Okay, that's it for now, everyone. Laszlo Montgomery here, signing off from Los Angeles, California on a gorgeous November day. I had to turn on my AC today. It was so hot. Think about coming back again once more with feeling for part six in our ever-expanding Warlord series here at the China History Podcast.